live now yep That's all right true. so christoph hi great to see you and uh, thanks for taking the time this morning to have a chat with us um i suppose in the first instance we have a lot of people joining and uh, we'll be letting them in over the period of time as usual and we'll be recording this session um again i suppose just for clarity and gdpr purposes or it's for all eu colleagues uh, given the fact that it's recorded, uh, if you have any issues, please step off deck now. And uh, if not, we look forward to engaging with you over the period of time. I guess the purpose of the exercise really is to um, have a chat with you about issues in regards to CSR and ESG and the whole sustainability agenda, and particularly in terms of the European and, and especially the French context. Mm -hmm. At the outset, maybe just to, I suppose, recap, um, we're here on behalf of the Institute of Management Consultants and Advisors, who again has a French cohort and uh, you're flying the flag with us this morning Christophe as the uh, the Frenchman and uh, thank you for as I said earlier giving us your time the institute here in Ireland is a, a significant operation in terms of its footprint it would transcend across a lot of different categories of management consultancy uh, and uh, these particular master classes that we're having are really powerful because we get best practice and uh, the zeitgeist thinking in terms of specific subjects uh, that the members are interested in Obviously, this one, ESG, is, is top of the agenda at the moment and certainly going forward. And we'll touch on some of the hotspots uh, over the period ahead uh, that you're seeing in terms of the European theatre and beyond. Um, I suppose just from a housekeeping point of view, anyone that's interested in getting any information, www.imca.ie or drop us an email at admin at imca.ie. Fiona will be happy to have a chat with you about membership or indeed uh, fellowship and so forth and so on. Uh, our newsletter goes out, you're um, welcome to subscribe, we get it, I think one went out there just recently with lots of information and uh, events that are occurring and of course the, the Golf Classic with our colleagues in the MBA Association. So look, without any further ado, uh, it's not me that you're here to see, but we will be having a chat, um, I suppose, collectively, and we'd welcome any questions that you have over the period as well. So please feel free to put it in the chat box and we'll get to them at the, at the end. Um, or indeed, if, if you like, uh, drop us an email. And uh, Christoph very kindly has said that if there's CSR related or ESG, we'll get back to you after the event and we'll answer any questions that you may have subsequently. So, Christoph, um, we are we are um, old colleagues, I suppose, to a certain extent. We've we've uh, worked together in the past on a number of uh, environmental projects in terms of the uh, the heating space, and we were probably ahead of the pace in, in regards to that kind of uh, movement uh, back uh, in the times of high efficiency when it was coming online first, and uh, that was really interesting, I suppose, in terms of the Italian perspective of manufacturing, and also the UK and here in Ireland and in France. I think if you remember Chape would have been one of the the primary products uh, and Baxi, uh, I think, as I recall as well. So they were really cutting edge uh, and ahead of the, the zeitgeist and the movement of sustainability in terms of driving efficiency and performance. But now if we leap forward 20 years later, uh, we're seeing a global movement uh, in terms of recognition that, uh, you know, the whole issue surrounding CSR, which has become global and ESG, uh, which is very much kind of in the, uh, the space and particularly after COP21, um, uh, has become kind of, I suppose, the mega trends. And we look at mega trends. A lot of our members are really interested in terms of the sustainability agenda and, you know, the implications for their business and how they can assist their clients. And I know CSR is the particular niche area that you operate in. But sometimes here in Ireland, we can be parochial to our own kind of footprint. We are an island nation and uh, we lose sight sometimes of the, the bigger equation. Although clearly the uh, the recent events in the Ukraine has affected everybody. And, the, you know, equally, one would imagine we'll talk about it a little bit later, the implications that has for sustainability in the short term. Uh, and equally, uh, in terms of the medium and long term, and we've seen what happened with the EU and Ursula uh, yesterday making that announcement uh, with the oil and so on, and how that's going to affect energy, energy pricing, and indeed, you know, the implications for the, the global footprint in terms of sustainability and carbon emissions. So maybe um, as I draw Brett after that very quick uh, gallop of an introduction, perhaps it might be just fruitful, Christoph, maybe just to introduce yourself for the audience and give yourself a little bit, of, I suppose, a little bit of uh, background to who you are and what you do, um, just to give us a paint picture. And we equally recognize and are very touched, Christoph, by the color uh, uh, coding that you have behind you uh, today. Uh, very appropriate uh, in terms of the times we're in. So uh, kudos to you for that. We would support that initiative. Okay, thanks, Pat. Uh, hi, everybody. 
thanks for joining this uh, little conference. Hope you will enjoy it. Um, as Pat said, we worked together uh, when we were in uh, Baxi, he as a head of uh, Baxi Ireland and me as a managing director for commercial products. It was back in the beginning of the, this century. And in between, we have done um, a few different things, um, he and me. I have managed a few companies, small businesses always in um, industry, heating, uh, photovoltaics. Um, and now I want to use my experience and uh, the things I've learned in order to improve the um, corporate social responsibility of small businesses, uh, mainly in France. And uh, we say, we talk about businesses from uh, one to 50 people, uh, because now, uh, as Pat says, there are new regulations uh, being implemented in 2000 and 2023 that will have an impact, but on a bigger corporation. But I personally think that uh, the sooner you start uh, with uh, CSR and the ESG as a company, uh, the better you will be prepared when you reach the levels that are now um, asked as uh, extra financial performance reports. Uh, which are now on 500 employees or four, 400 million um, euros in the sets uh, that are still quite high for uh, small businesses. But the sooner you start and the sooner you place ESG as a, um, a driver in your business and your business plans, uh, the better and you the sooner you will be ready when um, the the, le the levels will go down uh, which uh, will happen in the three to five next years and uh, I think every company will have ESG um, auditing and uh, will have ESG um, uh, directives to follow um, say in the next five years okay so i mean that's interesting and we would kind of see that kind of line of, of sight uh, as well and it, it has been a, a huge shift i suppose the pandemic uh, jumped it uh, ahead as well people had maybe more time to think and recognize what was important um but i suppose you know digital transformation being one of those kind of huge jumps and consequently working from home uh agenda and i suppose the reduction in carbon footprint as a consequence we saw a huge reduction in emissions in terms of transport for example during the uh the pandemic clearly because people were remaining at home so it was interesting to see what could be achieved from a from a global perspective when it's enforced upon us um, and as we are in a burning platform i guess within the people planet and profit uh side of the house would you say in the French context, and I know Macron has just come back in again recently and been re-elected, but do you think the general population in France have, have bought into sustainability as a principle at this point? I think um, in France, many people are concerned about um, environment, which you do not see in the votes in the general election um, that happened recently, because you mentioned uh, the re-election of um, Emmanuel Macron, and we had only about around 5% of the people voting for um, ecology. Um, as long as ecology is mixed with, um, say, left-wing oriented uh, parties, um, it will not go past 15%, which was the the most they reached in the European elections uh, 10 years ago. But I think uh, environment is a non, non politics issue. It's uh, something that is uh, right or left. It's um, a concern for the, the future, for um, the children, the, uh, the grandchildren, everybody. 
And we see more and more people ranging from, say, 15 to, to 30 years uh, of age that say uh, the world is in a bad shape now because of you. Because we, the, the leading people, managing people, the directors of companies, and uh, over 50, we have not cared enough about uh, environment. In fact, we didn't know, so uh, we couldn't do uh, much. But uh, these people are, um, say, getting angry with that. Uh, it seems there are, there is um, people, say, from ranging 15 to 30 are angry. And people over uh, 40 try to mend what the, 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 the problem and uh, by not consuming uh, plastics, by reducing their uh, heating at home, by um, not using uh, plastic bottles for uh, water, uh, by small things that you can do um, at your, uh, say, family level, uh, you can act. Uh, and in fact, we know the great polluters uh, in the world, uh, the United States, China, the, uh, all the, the, the countries in the Middle East uh, that use uh, uh, energy to reduce heating um, all over the year. We know that the tons of, uh, of carbon um, used are much higher in these countries, but at a small level, uh, we can act and we can try to, to improve uh, by not taking the car, by taking uh, This is on the, say, individual level. But um, there are also um, a strong uh, commitment now of the um, society in, in a global way to reduce uh, CO2 emissions, to reduce waste uh, consumptions, to reduce water uh, consumption um, on the company level, and also to use and implement uh, renewable energies. So that's to answer um, your question. Uh, I think people are very concerned about the environment. We see everywhere, um, we had a, a report uh, in France, I, I think you had the same uh, in Ireland, uh, saying that if we do not act within three years, uh, we will not be able to, to reduce the, the CO2 levels afterwards. So this is a great issue. Uh, Macron said uh, he would have a prime minister in charge of environment. So far, he has not done much in the last five years. The only, um, say, uh, minister that was... Uh, able to do something left about three, three months after his um, nomination. Uh, but Macron talks a lot, makes a lot of meetings, but do not act much. And I think people in France want that the politics, uh, politicians um, uh, do something now that, that they don't talk, only talk, but do something. Well, I think that's probably a global desire, and you know you are right. Um, but I suppose the um, the prerogative of youth, if we would, um, sh they should be protesting from fifteen to forty. They they have the energy for it, and that's what they should be doing. And I admire Greta Thunberg uh, for leading that kind of, uh, I suppose, um, current charge. Um, but it's it's what they should be doing. I suspect <laughs> generally that's what I like to see young people doing protesting and, and vigorously arguing their, their points. And they are right in this instance. I look, you know, I mean, water clearly is a global concern. That, that whole kind of issue uh, around water is, is a material concern. We are an island nation and we are very exposed uh, both from, from a water perspective, although it rains here quite a lot, but equally from an oil point of view and an energy point of view. And, you know, when I think of CSR particularly, I, I suppose I think of maybe the environmental, the, the ethical, uh, the philanthropic um, piece where, you know, we've just spoke to and, and the whole economic responsibility that we have 
corporately and as individuals. Mm. So, you know, what are you seeing in terms of the maybe the top three activities uh, that companies are taking in terms of, you know, your clients to help themselves up the ladder? Is there, you know, is there any kind of top tips that you would share that people could kind of embrace very yeah. quickly and effectively to actually help themselves and also, I suppose, send a signal to their clients that they're doing the right thing? You know, that um, all this issue on ESG and CSR stems from um, the norm. I saw uh, 26,000, which is a, a norm uh, that is uh, 150 pages. That which you have under your pillow every night, Christophe, yes? Yeah, <laughs> when I want to sleep quick, I try to read it, but I read it, in fact. And um, so mainly we can sum it up because um, this norm is something international that was devised for uh, communities all around the world with um, issues on uh, human rights, uh, issues on developing local communities that do not apply uh, really um, in Europe, whether in Ireland or, or in France, you don't care, you don't run a, a manganese uh, mine uh, in uh, Caledonia, uh, it's, it's not the same issues when you run a small business in, uh, in Europe. So I would say we, we will concentrate on the three Ps. That is uh, something uh, relatively simple. Uh, people, planet, and also profit. Because uh, I think, I personally think that uh, as long as money is not involved, uh, you cannot change things. Uh, this is a, a little um, cynic uh, perspective, but uh, as long as you don't see any money coming in, re in cost reductions, in improvement of sales, in uh, uh, improvement of your bonuses as a, as a leading manager, uh, you, you watch, but you don't act. And... Mm -hmm. uh, say I, I conduct audits uh, in small companies in in france um, and i have um, uh, an experience in uh, seeing small businesses say ranging from uh, one to 25 people or 50 people okay. that's interesting um, i have a, i have a, say uh, my 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 uh, my idea is to make an audit of the, the practices of the company. And when I go to small businesses, I see that they have a CSR uh, concern, but they have no uh, written stuff, uh, nothing, okay. uh, nothing. An written. audit trail. Yeah, they follow the regulation, the low regulation as regards uh, working conditions. They follow the laws and regulation as regards environment, as regards, say, um, the ISO 14001 norm, which is uh, on regulation. They follow everything on dangerous products. They follow everything on uh, discrimination uh, at work uh, as regards uh, women, uh, different races, different uh, LGBT issues uh, or anything. Everybody follows the regulation, but never made a statement. Um, it's starting. And I've seen some companies, but bigger with 500 people, they have already extra financial performance reports. They have audited, uh, they are audited every year, like, um, by big, uh, the big, the big companies are noticing uh, like Price, like McKinsey, like BCG, uh, um, which is quite a heavy, uh, heavy load of work for the auditing because it's um, starting to compare with the financial auditing every year. Uh, but these companies have the means, have the money for to do that, not the small businesses, and um, in fact with quite simple statements and uh, quite simple uh, 
processes, you can start, you may start a CSR um, uh, work and a CSR, you may start towards CSR and ESG with very simple um, acts. So that's like measuring them and uh, I suppose capturing what you're doing and, and measuring what you're doing uh, from an audit trail point of view. Yeah, it's uh, it's like you you need first to to assess your practices with an audit of what mm -hmm. you do. Uh, with say you have a fifty to eighty questions uh, to answer uh, to rate yourself because uh, what's not measured cannot progress. So uh, yeah. you need first a first assessment of your uh, practices. Generally, you will be quite bad, in fact, in the beginning, uh, because um, uh, you need then to decide on an action plan uh, to implement uh, the, 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 the CSR really in the company or uh, the organization. You and would this be annually over three years you would do it? So you would have a kind of a progression. You would see the baseline in year one yeah. and build it up. Yeah, in, in the beginning, it's quite light because uh, it's, uh, it's not light. You, you, you need to make the statements, then you need to, to have an action plan, then you need to have, uh, say, meetings with uh, the people in your organization uh, to tell them what you are um, going for. And then you need to, to, as in every business and everything, you need to have, a, say, a steering committee. Uh, you need to have a, a follow-up um, on an Excel sheet or stuff like that uh, on the actions that you implement. Okay. And you can go very fast from, uh, say, bad to good to better uh, in your CSR um, and Christoph, do, do you, for example, uh, obviously you're an independent audit uh, that you would do and companies, I, I'm assuming it would be important to have an independent person audit your actions. But when, when you, where do you recommend they, for instance, harvest some fee, uh, positive kind of um, uh, return on their investment? So would, would they, where did they publish this? Do you recommend they do it on their websites or their annual reports? Or what, what, what are you seeing? I think um, um, CSR, uh, we will be compared to do it uh, in the next future, as I said um, in our introduction. So um, the soonest you start, the, the better. And um, it may be also, I have seen companies where it's used as the core of the, um, the future business, um, having... Uh, people um, uh, implied in the way you do CSR uh, creates uh, employee loyalty, um, helps, helps you to recruit um, better elements because the, uh, as I said, young people are very much concerned about the environment and in case they have two offers uh, the same, uh, level of uh, wages, they will choose a company that has a better uh, CSR uh, or ESG rating. Uh, and that which rate, which when you say that just to be I mean that we're seeing that here in Ireland as well, but that that whole kind of retention and recruitment issue is, is manifestly a big issue. And we are seeing that kind of generation looking at the, the I suppose the optics around the organizations that they're going to deal with in terms yeah. of so what ratings um, are, you know, what ratings agency are they looking at? Where, where do you see they're looking at these ratings? How do they compare like with like? So far, uh, it's not compulsory. So you have many ratings agencies. You had um, in the past independent rating agencies on ESG because ESG is also an issue in investment funds. Sure. Uh, you had people investing um, in, say, uh, um, I would say, in companies that were out of uh, alcohol, al out of uh, tobacco, out of pornography, that had um, so 
implemented a real no discrimination policy. And there were independent agencies that are now being bought by big companies like uh, Standard and Poor's have acquired recently um, independent agencies and ESG is becoming an issue because uh, as I said, it's not compulsory, but it helps you uh, if you have a proper uh, communication within your company on your uh, ESG approach, on your ESG achievements. It helps you recruit people. It helps you, um, it, it may help you have a competitive advantage compared to um, competition. Uh, it's also becoming an issue on subsidized loans. Uh, okay, you, yeah, we've seen that, that too, may, yeah. Yeah, that you may get, you may get lower loan rates for your company when you borrow money because you have a good ESG rating. And I think it will be very, we will have in very short time, a, um, a very a, a much more um, standardized uh, approach to ESG that will be the same in Ireland, that will be the same in France, yes, yes. that will be the same in Germany. And you, there are some strong pushes towards uh, this say, standardization of practices. Uh, you have this, to have the same audit. Um, we watched that, yes, yeah, say back uh, in the last century, uh, when we were engaged into uh, ISO 9001, for example, yes, on, on quality issues. I remember implementing an ISO 9001 in the chemical company where I worked for. Um, there was a standardized auditing procedure and um, there was companies that were um, homologated to, to conduct these audits. But so far in ESG and CSR, it's uh, like the Wild West for the, the, the time being. It's a jungle. You, you have no real, um, no, no say, uh, worldwide auditing procedures or European procedures. It's coming. There will come in, there'll come in time uh, over the next 36 months. We're seeing a, co a coalition uh, that they're, I suppose, they're coming together with the EU regulations, excuse yeah, me, that are coming down the track. But I, I was just reflecting. You know, I was talking to a neighbor's daughter there recently, um, and she's highly qualified. Um, she did her master's and she got offered an well, She was actually working with one of the big practices here in town, um, a very secure, very, very um, good operation, good organization, part of a global uh, partnership. And she left and went to a startup. And I was asking her, you know, <laughs> why would you, what was the logic behind that? And, and you know, we were having a chat about it. Now, outside of the excitement end of it, you know, she wants to be kind of the energy and so on. She said one of the primary reasons was that it was carbon neutral, the startup. And philosophically, uh, um, it was very much aligned to her, her thinking. Now, we, you know, I come from the west of Ireland, uh, where the next parish is Boston, and we have our backs to the sea, and we would have always been taught that you can't live on scenery. So um, it's, it's an interesting evolution, I suppose, in terms of work practices. And, you know, we're, we're looking at a post-pandemic great kind of tectonic shift, if you will, in work practices. And that generation that are coming up now have a completely different uh, philosophical view the old kind of, I suppose, established order that you had jobs for life don't really exist anymore. Um, mm -hmm. Not to any large degree outside of the civil service. I think that it has existed for the last 20, 30 years anyways, but certainly that generation don't see themselves in the same job for, for life. They don't mm -hmm. see themselves in the same job for more than 36 months. They're moving. And there is a, a great hunger as well for them to kind of physically, you know, trod the globe and, and see the world and so on, particularly post pandemic. So when they look at an organization, you know, um, as a potential employer, OK, I guess they're probably looking at the website uh, in the first pass. That's probably their, their shop window in terms of 
of that. I mean, do you think to that end, it's important that SMEs, for example, would be reflecting their policies um, on the whole kind of CSR and environment on their website so that they can see very easily um, the philosophy of the organization that they're, they're going to kind of work for? Um, are, you know, are you seeing a move towards that a little bit to make it, you know, we've discussed this in the past, Christoph, that our, our own here core philosophy is the easierness principle that you make it as easy as possible for people to engage with you. I mean, are you seeing that now kind of coming to pass in the websites of your customers and clients that they are thinking um, outside the box, if you will, to use that awful term a little bit in terms of making themselves more attractive for those next generation employees? And one of the ways they can do that is through, for instance, a positive CSR um, uh, vista. I think um, when you look at websites and uh, at companies that have uh, a CSR, ESG commitment, you will very easily see their report because they, um, with big companies, they are compared to uh, to have an um, extra financial performance report. That is a nice piece that you can put on your website. You may also um, say uh, have a, a CSR report that you put something independent, not the same as the extra financial performance report, but the. Um, the young people, uh, they are not stupid. And uh, they say that um, if uh, the company is communicating, it's greenwashing. OK. And you need you need to have um, an independent, uh, recognized uh, structure that um, assess your performances as regard CSR. Otherwise, it's not worth much. Okay. And, uh, this is the the problem we, we had. Um, we had a big issue. Uh, we, we have companies that are uh, worldwide recognized, uh, such as Sustainability, such as uh, MSCI, such as uh, True Cost, which is the one that was uh, bought by Standard and Poor's. Okay. And um, these companies have. Uh, well, you see, you have problems because uh, one of the best companies as regards ESG is McDonald's, for example. Um, and all the young people, we say that beef is a nightmare for the environment. Uh, but they have practices that make them recognize as a, one of the best companies in um, ESG for the funds and stuff. We had an issue in France that was a big issue um, on the RPA, which is a, um, something that were, uh, was a kind of, uh, for all people, uh, retired all people, uh, they were, um, it's a, it was a very big company uh, in France running uh, kind of, uh, say, uh, all people um, hospitals. Yes. And um, they were crushed by the, the authorities uh, with a, a book that went out, uh, say, three months ago on their practices and stuff. And for example, RPR, we had a um, uh, a company called Mirova that was a, a Natixis uh, subsidiary was the, the third investor in RPA as um, a uh, responsibility fund uh, investing in companies because RPA was rated uh, quite high in uh, ESG stuff. And this is a big issue because uh, um, greenwashing on the websites uh, is something that uh, most of the companies do. And you, yeah, need I can, I can, I, I can remember. Sorry to cut across you. What it really struck home was the whole Volkswagen emissions uh, scandal there a couple of years back. I mean, that wiped a billion or so off there uh, very quickly. I mean, that was a big kind of red letter kind of moment, wasn't it? And then prior to that, 
if you go back, I suppose it would be now we'd look at it as greenwashing was the whole Nike scandal in terms of their manufacturing process in the Far East. I mean, and, and they're still occurring. So, you know, industry is sometimes taking uh, the path of least resistance and hoping they won't get caught. Um, but I, I think you're right that uh, generation are looking beyond uh, I suppose kind of um, self uh, publicist uh, corporate kind of statements and looking for independent verification yeah they want they want independent statements on the real ESG uh, commitment from the companies and as you said Volkswagen they paid uh, 15 billion euro okay. dollars because of their uh, Emission cheating, emission cheating stuff. Uh, we have other examples like uh, the Deep Water Horizon uh, yes. Yes. with BP. They, they paid all together, I think it's uh, $65 billion uh, to, to, to get rid of their what they, the, the environmental problems created by the, the accident. Uh, it's a lot of money. Uh, this is more for investors. This is more for uh, uh, investors don't want to be cheated. Uh, uh, as one of my friends said in the banking uh, industry, um, if you want to invest in only um, in, in uh, the lowest energy consumption company, if you invest your funds in banks, it's the best. Banks they would the say road. that, wouldn't they? <laughs> <laughs> or insurance companies, but you cannot you cannot uh, think that they they will reinvest also in, in other in other stuff. But um, well, but banks have had their issues as well. They are not without sin, shall we say? Um, but yeah, as well, thank you. If, if we look at kind of the profession that we're both in, in terms of management consultancy, I suppose, and the audience that this will be going out to over the next couple of weeks, and they will be interested to know, you know, uh, what actions they can take in terms of, you know, you know, that to assist their clients. So again, if we were kind of bring, breaking it down a little bit to kind of look at actions that um, consultants could actually implement themselves to assist their clients. So, you know, you mentioned the ISO standards and stuff like that. So they're independently verifiable in terms of audit and tracking and tracing. They're, they're very good and universally accepted. But again, you know, from a, um, I suppose, a client perspective, what can we as management consultants do to assist our clients in terms of giving them advice? So, you know, to, um, uh, if they're not already on the journey, um, maybe to start them on the journey, but what meaningful kind of steps can we, suggest to them to get them on the path or, or kind of promote the, the whole concept further? I think um, as regards consultants, uh, there will be plenty of opportunities for uh, new businesses because uh, the corporate sustainability reporting directive, uh, which uh, comes into effect next year, yeah. that means that we have the, the 50 thousand biggest European companies, over 250 employees that will be concerned. Yeah. So this is a huge uh, play field for consultants uh, all over uh, Europe. And it's a short term stuff because uh, it's 2023 with um, starting 1st January and the reports coming out in 2024 so wow, that's uh, very that's a very tight timeline yeah it's a 14 month timeline and uh we and do you think do you think they're generally aware of this christoph i mean would it be even helpful to actually tell or start telling our clients that this you know is a meaningful uh issue that's going to be hitting them front and center within the next kind of 12 months uh I wasn't aware of that myself uh, until uh, three or four months ago, but that's why I created my, my business in, in that uh, CSR um, field, because uh, okay. uh, as you say, nobody knows, nobody knows uh, the trouble. So, I mean, <laughs> that's, uh, you know, the, the size of the prize, that's a huge opportunity for both the kind of, I suppose, the yeah. profession, but equally to assist our clients. Uh, in a meaningful kind of way and what I'm hearing from you is that generally 
the, the majority of them are not aware of this obligation, legal obligation that is coming at them uh, next January and that they're going to have to report the following year. So I'm thinking, you know, what we need to be doing both as a profession, but for our clients is banging the drum a lot more about the actual EU directive, um, because that's what's going to drive a lot of this, isn't it, you think? You, you will have a mandatory check on, on ESG and uh, CSR very soon with uh, KPIs management uh, and, and a close look at what you are doing as regards uh, CO2, waste, water, uh, renewable energies and, and people. people. Uh, this is, um, as you said, to go back on the, the consultant issue, it's a new field of uh, implementations for uh, consultants. And also, um, it's a fine, uh, a very fine uh, uh, job for people over 50 with a strong managing background because uh, it's not only measuring, it's also um, uh, giving hints how to go from bad to good to best practices. And uh, people that have already management uh, background and uh, leading company background or in businesses, uh, big or small, bigger, big as you do, and small as I do, have a, a real new field of implementations for their competences. And uh, also it's, it's uh, say, I would say it's a very interesting issue because you contribute to the future. Uh, you contribute to save the planet in um, in a real way. Okay, I mean we have, we have a saying here in Ireland, Christophe, which and, and France being a Celtic cousin, that we it's uh, in, in Irish in Gaelic is that we all live in each other's shadow, mm -hmm. um, and that that I suppose in principle is is the philosophy of of ESG and, and CSR to a large degree. But if we look at current events, maybe just as we're coming to the end of the, the program here this morning. Um, we've seen the, the awful uh, circumstances that have occurred out in uh, Eastern Europe in terms of the Ukraine and so on and what's going on out there. And it's, it's desperate. Um, but having said that, um, there's a broader context as well in terms of the implications of those activities that will cascade out over us from September, I'm guessing, onwards from the energy kind of, um, uh, I suppose, um, purchasing and procurement normally kind of escalates as the winter approaches and, and heating becomes an issue and so forth. And, we, you know, here in Ireland, we're trying to embrace wind and solar, but we haven't quite got there yet. So, uh, you know, the whole ESG agenda um, took a right hammering over the last kind of couple of months because of the implications of the uh, the Ukrainian conflict um, and, you know, the impact that it's going to have on oil. And we've seen, you know, the German dilemma and the Croatian dilemma and, and, and the Hungarian dilemma with oil particularly. Um, and we're not even going there on gas at the moment. So, um, you know, events, dear boy, have overtaken us to a certain degree, which... You know, we were coming out of a pandemic, um, you know, the, the light at the end of the tunnel was, you know, hopefully vaccines had, 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 had been kind of created and it was great to see. And suddenly that light at the end of the tunnel turned into an oncoming train that has hit us now from, from the east. Where, where do you see this whole kind of the, the impact of, from an energy point of view? Uh, or do you feel, you know, you, you can share your thoughts in terms of where that's going to go over the next 36 months? Because, you know, I, I, my sense of it is it's going to have a huge impact on consumers and corporates alike. Um, it hasn't really hit us yet, but I, I suspect from, I'm thinking September onwards, and this thing could run for years. Um, the impact will clearly be money because uh, the price of gas uh, has already doubled in the last two years, it will go on because uh, GNL uh, coming from US or uh, from uh, uh, say the Emirates uh, will be on a higher price basis than uh, Russian gas. Uh, you will have an, a huge impact on uh, individuals because uh, on uh, say community housing, uh, People, we see their uh, the district heating model. Yeah, yeah, district heating. Uh, the 
it will it will grow from from say 150 percent um, and as individuals also the same for companies um, uh, you will have to increase your uh, sales price because uh, the two have a, a huge impact on your uh, charges yeah on your expenses sorry your, your impact um, yeah. you you will need to adjust and uh, transportation costs uh, heating costs um, will have a huge impact on uh, your prices and your costs as a company so you may act with isolation in case you have um, uh, offices uh, workspaces factories that are not uh, isolated you may act and you may get uh, subsidized money from um, regions from governments you may act on your transportation costs by reducing them you, you talked uh, about the pandemic. We had um, a year where we made uh, video conferences uh, instead of visiting customers. Yeah, this, this is an issue for many people because uh, you many salespeople think you need to meet the people to sell. Uh, in fact, during one year or, in, or two years, uh, we have been visiting them by computer and by uh, video. So uh, there was a huge reducing in costs um, in travel expenses in companies. And also it was benefit, a benefit for the, um, the planet because uh, we didn't use uh, oil or, um, or planes to travel to see customers. Mm. But I think the impact of energy Ireland will not be that touched by the, the Russian oil because you have, I think, lower than 20% of your oil coming from, uh, come from Russia, like France. It's not um, um, Hungary or Bulgaria. That have we have a lot, of our, a lot of our gas coming from it, though. I mean, we're at the yeah, end of the pipeline. Gas is not talked about for the time being. We, on the EU um, a perspective, they talk about oil in, to get rid of the, the Russian oil in the next six months. Means that uh, it's not tomorrow, it's not uh, next yeah, month. So six months is very short. And uh, the other thing we're seeing, Christoph, is for instance, there has been a big drive towards biomass uh, here, okay? Um, biomass in terms of replacing solid fuel, mm. uh, in terms of carbon uh, heavy uh, fuels. And, you know, a lot of that biomass was coming um, mm. out of uh, out of Russia, to be honest. Let's be, you know, it was coming out of the Russian forests and, and that area. Um, and that's all been kind of stopped now. So the, the challenge we're seeing, ironically, is... Um, because of the carbon footprint from bringing it in from say south america or from you know out in the, uh, the far east it makes a nonsense of the whole thing so uh there's there's a law i think um, as a parkinson's law the law of unintended consequences are beginning to kick in and i suppose mindful of of our audience and mindful of of unintended consequences uh we don't want to run over too much this morning and um, i suppose the, the chinese maybe to finish up would have a an old saying that one should never loo uh, lose or waste a, a good crisis. Um, mm. But, you know, and, and to that end, I mean, when you look out over the next kind of few years, and I know you're, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of very upbeat about the opportunities in the CSR and ESG things. Ironically, this whole kind of unfortunate episode and, and human tragedy of biblical scales will only further drive the CSR and ESG agenda because people will become reliant, you know, recognize that they need to become more self-reliant and drive that sustainability agenda. Um, so maybe if I just ask you maybe a final question. Um, do, do you, you know, when you look and go into a, an SME and they're normally kind of maybe under 50 people uh, in an organization here, and uh, that, that, you know, we see that kind of the small, medium-sized firms are kind of those that employ under 50, okay? Um, and you are giving them your, you know, your your advices in terms of having looked over their operational footprint and you know how they go about their business. Um, what's the number one 
the number one thing they can do to help themselves in terms of their CSR compliance? Or what's, what's your number one piece of advice for them? Uh, as I say, we start from scratch um, and uh, communicate. They okay, have to, they have to yeah. clearly uh, make a statement on their CSR commitment. And this is the first thing that you need to do. Okay. Well, that's, that's a perfect kind of conclusion to the, the session here. Uh, Jojo, not war, war. And, and I mean, how right you are, it is about communicating and having uh, an appropriate narrative in terms of your sustainable uh, philosophy and kind of that whole ethical kind of approach that you, you, you take to how you go about your business. Christoph, it's been a pleasure to catch up with you again this morning. Uh, it's been a, a real privilege to uh, get your insights in terms of the, the French uh, way of, of looking at it in the European way. As I say, sometimes here we can be a little bit insular as an island looking out, but we're proud Europeans and, and we're looking forward to the next phase of the EU regulations and helping our clients to actually uh, embrace those and be compliant with them. And maybe we might ask you back again, perhaps, uh, you know, at the end of the year, just to get your insights and where we're at at the moment. Uh, your domain knowledge is very deep and it's always kind of uh, great to, to get those insights. So, um, which is the, the Irish for thank you very, very much. Uh, au revoir. And uh, thank you, merci, uh, to all our colleagues who stepped in. And uh, this will be available online uh, thereafter. So thank you. Good morning. Lovely to talk to you. Bye-bye. Au revoir. Thank you very much. Bye, Pat.